thank you for being here in Wikimania 2015. A quienes no hablan español, les queremos recordar que hay traducción simultánea disponible. We have here with us Lourdes Epstein from Monterrey and Ernesto Priani from the UNAM and also from the, citizen, the Network for Citizens Digital Rights. And I think that this is the idea for this track in Wikimania 2015. The idea is to think about to criticize, to question the foundational norms of Wikipedia, the pillars of Wikipedia. In the editing community of this work that has 35,000 articles in 280 languages, are all cross-sectional and include a wide variety of disciplines of knowledge. And they are basically five main rules, which are precisely the ones that we're calling five pillars, as a metaphor of that which underpins Wikipedia. Those five regulatory policies, which are all cross-sectional, which appear in every single edition in Wikipedia, in Japanese, in Polish, in Nahuatl, in all of the 188 languages, they all have the same languages. Maybe there are hundreds of policies, maybe there are hundreds of discussions in each one of these editions, but these five basic rules never change. The first one is encyclopedic relevance, meaning anything that is in Wikipedia has to be relevant from an encyclopedic point of view. The second pillar is that they're neutral. The third one is that it's a free content from the perspective of Commons license, then that there is respect, protocol of good etiquette between the people working on the project. And the fifth pillar is that if anything needs to change in these rules, it should be for the purpose of improvement. So why don't we start talking about the first pillar, which is the encyclopedic relevance. What do you think? What does that mean to you? What do you understand by the term relevance? Who would like to start? OK, if you want to, I can start. One of the first things that has always called my attention about Wikipedia is that they wanted to use the format of an encyclopedia, that they wanted to go back to this age-old model of the French Enlightenment, basically, and turn it into a new model of transferring knowledge in the 21st century, with, of course, the adequate adaptations that have been carried out. But this model of the encyclopedia, I think, is very positive from the perspective that it helps to synthesize a tradition that seeks to document some sort of universal knowledge. Of course, the main problem that the Wikipedia faces, because perhaps back in the Enlightenment, that universal knowledge had a lot more to do with instrumental knowledge. What I mean is that what the encyclopedia intended to do was to make practical, pragmatic knowledge that was available at the time more disseminated. But of course, the scope and how far the Wikipedia reaches nowadays was unthinkable back in those days. But the problem is then, or the question is, what is worthy of there being an article about it? And then who decides what is relevant? So the problem is not so much the format of the encyclopedia, but our understanding of what would be relevant within a structure of knowledge, because there is very important knowledge maybe for a small community that could not be considered relevant and therefore would not really be worthy of having an article written about them. And on the other hand, we have other issues that may be very common, that may be show the concept of relevance from a relativistic point of view. So the problem is, how do you structure this open intention to include knowledge, but at the same time you sort of discriminate between what could be considered shallow knowledge, which could be very boring anecdotes about an actor that are turned into a Wikipedia entry simply because it gets a lot of hits. Many people seem to be interested in that as opposed to something that could be of very deep significance to a small community, but since it is not relevant for a wide community, then it doesn't have an entry. 
I think it's very interesting to make this comparison with the 18th century encyclopedia and the Wikipedia today, where I think the one thing that remains the same is the purpose. What the encyclopedias of the Age of Enlightenment wanted to do was make knowledge accessible, and that is something that we want to do today as well, having a way to bring together universal knowledge, which is a daunting task. But what I do think is extremely relevant to highlight about Wikipedia's effort is that it's a very dynamic, open method. It is never closed, even as we consider the policies. When you read through the whole policies, by the time you're done, you think, okay, so then what are the policies if the last of the five pillars is that anything could be derogated or removed? So the idea was in the 18th century to bring together a lot of knowledge, practical knowledge, and the idea of having that knowledge brought together is to help people be freer. The notion of offering cognitive elements that will enable people to understand and act accordingly is essential, and that's why the spirit of encyclopedic knowledge remains. And then from that premise, there are a series of, of rules and premises that are very, that are based on the common sense, in the literal sense of the word, which is that most people should support it. So maybe, as Ernesto said, it's a minority. But for that minority, a particular issue could be very relevant. And as a part of a whole, this minority can offer vitality and can offer a lot of interest in the way we deal with a topic. And so from the perspective of the encyclopedia, when it was generated in the 18th century, that did not exist. Having a sort of authorized group to come up with a categorization, there was no other way to do it but sitting down and actually doing that categorization. But there was not no such thing as a wide group of people the way we have it today, and that's why I think we're living in the best possible times, because today we can really work as a group, as a big community in a way that was not possible back then. So I think encyclopedic knowledge had never been as encyclopedic as it is now. Now that you talk about the encyclopedia, what really stands out to me is this sense of it being collective knowledge, group knowledge. It's not just three people authorizing what is admitted and what is not, but it is an open debate of a lot of people saying, I'm interested in there being a, an article about pop. And why then make a distinction saying, well, pop is not high culture, it is not a fine art. No, it doesn't matter. It's, an, it's a matter of public interest. So if the encyclopedia in the 18th century was it was created with a more didactic, educational perspective, and because of that, it was more restrictive because the variety of opinions was limited. What the Wikipedia offers is a variety of perspectives, which makes knowledge more changeable because knowledge is never fixed. There are scientific, there's scientific knowledge that is generated every single day. And there's a sense that any topic can be either accepted or rejected. I think this really adds to the value of the traditional concept of encyclopedia because Wikipedia opens things up to consensus. What big groups or small groups consider important to include, both for its historical record, to keep track of something significant for their own personal lives, but at the same time to share it with the world. And I do mean literally the world. Something that could be very specific knowledge in a structured way, in an organized way, that is no less important, important than the entry about the molecule. And those two things are just as valuable because they're part of a culture. And I really, really appreciate that about the format that the Wikipedia has. Now, because we have this massification, this universalist thought, I think of Pascal's sphere, right? It's everywhere. But that's still a structure, isn't it? It still follows certain rules. 
and an organization. What would you criticize about this organization seen from the outside? Or let's not say from the outside because you yourselves are editors as well. But what do you think about it? It does have a structure and it has a specific structure. There is a single way to generate knowledge in this structure, but there are others that could be used. What do you think about that? I think that what we see in the fifth pillar is precisely a solution. It offers a solution to this question that you pose, which is it is a structure and it is this structure and not any other. The truth is that anything, any human endeavor needs to be created with a structure. There is no such thing as a structure less human creation. But when we see in the fifth pillar that any of the norms that somehow goes against this goal that we have of bringing knowledge together can be forgotten if we use your common sense that really opens things up because that means that this structure can be revised constantly it is self-critical in the way it is structured and therefore it can self-correct. It can never be outdated. It can never go against the possibility of gathering more knowledge. So I think that this is a very good reflection of not only how information can be managed in our day and age, but how it should be managed, how information should be managed in our day and age. Because when I talk about information, of course we're talking about a different level. I'm talking about knowledge. First we have data, then information, then knowledge, if we consider it from a hierarchical perspective. But here we see a very, very good, very healthy management and anybody who edits in Wikipedia sees these three levels, data, information, and knowledge, because whether it is their intention or not, they will be naturally navigating through those three layers, through this scheme. So it's a sort of metacognition. Besides the topic that you're editing at the time, there's a metacognition about that topic. And I think that this self-reflection is inherent in the work that we're doing, which is something that traditionally did not exist, not even in the scientific world. If you were carrying out scientific research for a paper, you weren't really reflecting on what you were building in terms of knowledge creation. And any Wikipedian does have that experience and that knowledge that they're not only contributing to increasing knowledge, but there's also a reflection going on about what that means. Let's say that any structure that is adopted needs to be questioned and needs to be questioned again and again. And of course, by adopting the model of this encyclopedia or adopting the model of the encyclopedia is something that can be questioned as well because there are a series of assumptions that cannot necessarily hold through time or remain true as time goes by because Wikipedia intends to present itself as an encyclopedia in order to avoid being a primary source but it has become a primary source so much so that there are very celebrated writers who have contributed to Wikipedia um, literary creation and so it has become a referential primary source so by adopting the encyclopedic model there's also the quality of validating knowledge. Even if you take it for granted that validating that knowledge is will not be recognized as such. Every model has its pros and it, its cons. Like the anonymity of the authors of encyclopedia articles is also a source of conflict because it is said that you cannot write something without assuming a responsibility, without making yourself accountable. So that has its pros and its cons. The problem might be that we have to review the understanding of knowledge within Wikipedia periodically. Does it really add up to our conception of knowledge all the time? When does it? When does it not? The Wikipedia 
came to take the place of the encyclopedias of the past. Of that much, I am sure. A family used to spend millions, at least once in their lifetime, to buy a full encyclopedia. I remember when my mother bought two encyclopedias, like the original encyclopedia. And the original encyclopedia was something that you could buy on credit, like you bought it on installments. It was a long-term business for a family. And the Wikipedia has taken its place. Even the one Microsoft created, what was it called? Encarta. The Encarta encyclopedia, that seemed to be the future. It was the first digital one. But now we see that the future is in the web. The fact that it's free, the fact that it's open, has given a whole new perspective. This is the new model. It's the model that we need of knowledge today. These are all very good questions and very difficult to answer too. I think that the contribution, I don't know if we can talk about democratization of knowledge, that's a kind of controversial topic, but the way that Quality is generated through debate, through an open discussion. I think it makes it impossible to have a majority trolling someone else. Like if an entry has the support of argument and solid arguments, then it will stay. It's not easy. It's not basic knowledge. There's a lot of work behind it. So sure, theoretically, anyone can edit Wikipedia, but there's a whole process of discussion, of review, to determine whether something will be approved or not, whether a change will be approved or not. And that's, I think, the value of the way we are producing knowledge. So why is this position more important than this other position? Well, because it has more solid arguments, it's been supported, it's been discussed through weeks or months or even years, in some cases, in the most controversial articles. And it is so accessible, and the way it is written is so accessible, that people are no longer scared, as, as the general population, let's say, because in the academia or in scholarly work, you're used to reading very difficult, confusing, and wordy articles. And when you read the Wikipedia, it's not like that. You can have access to a very quick answer, something like, when was this person born? Or you can also... Uh, have a good first attempt to approach a particular topic and the format allows that for you. It comes from this list of 50 biographies, so go through that list and the fact that it's not primary knowledge, which was mentioned before, I disagree. I also do think that it is a primary source for, for some, especially for a topic that you're going to get into from scratch, a topic that you're about to learn something about that you don't have a lot of ideas about it, you start in the Wikipedia, it's a very good starting point for people, you get a general understanding of it and then you can study further. So I do think that the Wikipedia is a very important reference. Whereas in the past, if you did not own an encyclopedia at home, which not only was very expensive, but also occupies a whole bookshelf, you ha didn't have access to that knowledge. And nowadays, you do. So I do think it has made knowledge more democratic. If you have access for five minutes to a computer or to a mobile equipment, then you can have access to it. You don't need to pay in installments for two years to be able to have that knowledge at the reach of your hand at home. And also, when you have knowledge on paper in the encyclopedia, it seems to be written in stone. I mean, it takes a really long time to change it, whereas the Wikipedia changes every day, every minute, every 10 seconds. I just had something to add about this concept of primary sources. I think that it's one thing to say that it is the primary source for a reader who is first coming into a topic, and then it's another thing to say that the information that is included there is originated from primary sources, meaning as a researcher, I cannot discover a virus and make that public for the first time through Wikipedia, and that's what a primary source would be. That's what I mean when I say that Wikipedia is not a primary source. It does not include primary sources, but rather information that is already referenced in other sources, and that's why it's called the secondary source. Okay, so trying to sum up all of these things that you have been saying, there are a couple of, of aspects that I'd like to highlight before we move on to the second pillar. The first thing is that according to your logic, Wikipedia, and I heard someone say yesterday that the Wikipedia community resists 
to take on its political role, maybe because of a sort of public humility. But the truth is that whether you want it or not, you have a political presence. So what I think or what I'm perceiving from what you say is that there's a whole new structure that exists maybe beyond the realm of what could be considered primary, secondary, or tertiary sources. But maybe from a pedagogical perspective, we'd have to redefine the terms primary and secondary because often I read texts that seem to be right on the fence between primary and secondary sources. So that could be my question. Do you think we need to reconsider from a pedagogical point of view what is primary and what is secondary? And then going to the second pillar, the fact that it is neutral. The question is, do you think a human being is truly capable, capable of taking a step back and see things as an objective observer? Do you think neutrality is possible? And I don't think we're going to have much time to go some anywhere beyond the second pillar. But what do you think about this? About your first question, I what immediately came to mind was an article that I read about a movie because one of the most interesting aspects of Wikipedia is that it doesn't ignore the pop culture. And I'm, I'm using that term to refer to very many things, let's say. You can write an article, and there are articles about um, television events. I don't know, a TV show. An interview. An interview that was carried out on TV that then became famous. We do include those entries. Now the question is, what are those? What type of source? So, okay, maybe they're not primary sources from an academic perspective, because no one will be writing an academic research paper about that, or at least nobody has done that yet. Well, okay, maybe you, but, but that's a whole different story. Yeah, yeah, I know, historians do everything. Yes, I get that. Yeah, but I'm ignoring you guys for now. In many cases, Wikipedia doesn't really show those primary sources. And so it becomes a primary source itself in terms of disseminating cultural phenomena that might not usually be considered part of the academic world. That's a phenomenon that is a reality and that we need to consider. The fact that there is an entry on a current president or a former president who is very polemic about whom no historical or scholar papers have been written, but only journalistic work that have never really occupied the role of primary sources, even though they do in some areas, but that are not considered as such in the scholarly world. World. So what is then the role or the position occupied by Wikipedia? And this also leaves, leads me to neutrality. After working for many years in, in for a newspaper, for a journal, I know that there's no such thing as neutrality. That simply does not exist, not even as an effort. So then what does exist? What can exist? Because we got to think that the Wikipedia community has a political position about many things. And sometimes it's not an open statement, but rather just because it is part of a community that holds a series of values, principles about society, about knowledge, and about life. So even neutrality, when the neutrality of the whole Wikipedia community is really questionable, it's not a reality. So then I also want to talk about time, because generally, as with everything, as time goes by, our opinions change. So time will also continue to play a very important, important role in how we understand neutrality and how neutrality is generated. Neutrality is something that will probably be reached in time. And finally, I'd like you to think, I'd like to invite you to think about the values that the Wikipedia community has decided to to hold and uphold as their own. And finally, I'd just like to say that Latin America is uh, an, has access to content a lot, but it is not precisely a creator of knowledge. What I mean is that there are many articles on the Wikipedia that respond to the opinion of not a Latin American 
a creation, but rather Spanish, a European perspective. And you can see that in the language, even, the language that it used. So what I mean is that there are still marginalized communities within the Wikipedia. So, of course, we need to start generating more content in Spanish in Latin America. That means we need to get into the debate, first of all, and start gaining ground. But at the same time, the Wikipedia has to constantly be reviewing what communities because let's say sometimes maybe Wikipedia does this for a, an unidentified reason which may be even that the specific culture of a community does not allow for access I agree with Ernesto when when talking about the pillar of neutrality I think that as a human being it's impossible to be neutral to be 100% objective I think it has more to do with an agreement or with a consensus there is no such thing as neutrality or rather it's something that after discussion you come to an agreement and you think okay this is the content that we will be producing now but that's today if tomorrow there's a new argument a more stronger argument then it will change so neutrality the way it is understood in the five pillars I think has to do with not being extremist not being in the far right or in the far left or not uh, being opinionated about a particular political party but rather to be a negotiator to try to articulate an inclusive way of thinking where you are actually considering the greatest amount of opinions as possible and it is as faithful as possible but I don't think neutral is the right wor word I would say consensual maybe I would actually change the word in the pillar okay or maybe it has to do with enriching our sense of neutrality I'm thinking about when we ask, when students are asked to write a paper and you're working with a student and you tell them that they have to be neutral, that they have to be objective. So what I mean is even if it is impossible perhaps by definition to be neutral, I understand why it's a pillar. Because what happens with a student when you ask them to be neutral, and of course there are topics where it's easier to be neutral than others. There are some where it's almost impossible and there are some where it's easy. But the point is, that students take an opinion or a perspective that automatically helps them integrate opposite opinions and other voices to be able to sum it all up in an article. That didactic experience, uh, that pedagogical experience is what really makes sense to me and that's why I would defend the existence of that of that pillar. So I agree that consensus is a good word to describe it, but I think it's all about a pact, like a social pact, where you think these are all the options, this is everything that I had at hand when I was writing this article, if it is the case, if you're writing a new article, and let's say that the topic is somewhat polemic. I don't know. I think about the case of students. It sometimes makes them be more interested in a topic, but at the same time, it, it sets a challenge for them. And I think that same thing is true for a Wikipedian working on an article on a particular topic. I think it has to do with not just not, a, not a, an accomplishment or the goal of being neutral, but rather like having a disposition to try to be neutral. And I think that we could all agree on that. Thank you. That, those are great ideas that you have shared. Now trying to move on so that we can cover even more, even though we do have very little time left. I would ask you, in your own ideas, in your own work, in according to your own personal reflections, Wikipedia has the motto, even in its legal administrative work, there's the inclusion of the word free. It's all about freedom. How has Wikipedia made you freer? How do you perceive freedom in Wikipedia? And not only you as, as an individual in the way that you see the world, do you think that Wikipedia has somehow made you freer? Is there freedom in Wikipedia? And I talk about this in reference to the third pillar. Well, I don't know, many things. I direct the library and I am constantly going back and forth between these two worlds like 
free access articles and at the same time subscription based articles and sometimes the subscriptions are like millionaire investments and so I always sit here thinking about something as basic as human rights why is it that some people have access to things while others cannot and it's all part of the same chain people who have access to things are developed more because then they can have access to other things where people who didn't have access could not develop. And so I think to me it's really a moral issue. As member of an of a private academic institution, I have I feel a very high responsibility as a Mexican woman, as a Mexican individual, let's say. So the model that to me, the Wikipedia sets forth in terms of information management has to do with a possibility that exists out there, at least for my students, that if they have the privilege of being in a private university, the least they can do is then respond socially, have a social impact, and that could be through Wikipedia or any other source of information or knowledge management that can be out there. Before I started working on Wikipedia, I already had this idea in mind. When YouTube appeared, it was a great platform so that not only student projects could become more relevant because they would be made public, because it's not the same thing to do a project that only you will see than to be able to share it with the world. That already gives you an academic relevance but above all, it has to do with social responsibility, a social responsibility that cannot be um, held back any longer. I think that is true for any student, but even more so for private university students. What I would like to say is that I find it fascinating how sometimes you can be part of the voice that will be heard by many others as they understand something new. In my case, I work with practically unknown philosophers, except Giordano Bruno, of course, who is someone that everybody knows. But other than that, all of the other philosophers that I work with are relatively unknown figures. And so you usually need voices, voices that talk about these people that are considered authorized voices and that say what they think. It's fascinating when you can actually edit, when you can add, when you can make adjustments to a website, to an article that will reach so many people. That means that you somehow have an influence on some thing that is public, that is not private, that is collective and not individual. That means that your voice will be put together with other voices and therefore you will be able to share a vision, an idea, information about, for instance, in my case, it has been deeply satisfying, liberating even, to be able to add all of my references, my sources, for instance, to the Ficino entry or the Pico entry because that then I no longer have to tell my students, you have to go look in this website, this other website. No, no, just look at the Wikipedia entry and I don't have to explain further. But I know that this is available not only for my students, I know that this is a contribution that is public and that makes other academic sources that are not commonly consulted more visible. So as a collective experiment, I find this very liberating. And the fact that knowledge is free, which means that what I learned and what I know, I can then put to the service of others and put out there for others to discuss, to debate, to extend, to be even removed by others, is part of an expression of freedom. And it is a very deep expression of freedom. Nowadays, in Mexico, every single day we hear of a new case of plagiarism. And I don't know why they're all historians, by the way, these plagiarists, but every single day. And they're all members of CONACYT. They're all members of the National Research Institute Level 2 or Level 3. But it's interesting because we have here something that cannot be plagiarized or for which plagiarism is simply useless, it doesn't make any sense, then I think that there must be something right that we're doing. There must be something of value. I think that it is a very 
there's freedom, but with a sense of commitment. What I mean is I'm putting what I know to the service of, of others. And the fact that you're not signing it with your name is not, I think, a cowardly sense of anonymity, but rather because it doesn't matter that it's me. It's just knowledge. I have it. If it helps you, then take it. And if you don't, if you have something else to add, you can do so. So it's this freedom to disseminate, to spread the word, to share with millions of people what your point of view is, what you study, what you know, what you generate. That sort of forces you or it keeps you from writing, from taking it too lightly from from and you also know that no one will be plagiarizing the Wikipedia because it's it doesn't make any sense it's public it's out there it's for everybody but it is true that editors have that commitment of not just you know publishing anything or not publishing trash there's so much that you can do that there's a natural motivation to do it right even if you will not get a personal recognition because you won't be signing the article it will be there it will be up there until someone puts forth a stronger argument